let's go from there. So, uh, we're looking at Romans chapter 9 still in our lesson. We have more to cover on Romans 9, and we're talking about faith and works together, and how that the New Testament puts them together. And in Romans, we're looking at the integration of Jew and Gentile, and particularly in Romans 9, we're looking at the, uh, well, the really difficult readings here where, uh, well, where you can really take this the wrong way and uh, ascribe some really bad things to the way that God operates. And that's to be avoided, of course. So uh, we're going to take it apart like that and maybe go kind of slowly. But we are in Romans 9. We've been talking about the fact that, uh, again, at the outset of this, the sixth verse tells us not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel, which is setting for us the stage that we're talking about nations. Um, we looked at 7 through 9 talking about Isaac is the way that things are going to be uh, reckoned from here. And so the children of Abraham are reckoned through Isaac. And also... In 10 to 13, the children of, of Abraham are reckoned through Jacob, not through Esau. And uh, this is God's choice in the matter. Um, he chose Jacob to be the, the, the nation that from, or the one from which the nation of Israel would come, and Esau to be the one from which the nation of Edom would come. Um, and, and others, and that's his choice, and it had nothing to do with the individual's character or choices or will. It's just God decided that's how this is going to be for reasons in his own purview, not things that we necessarily understand or need to understand. And that's what this chapter is actually saying. But people misunderstand it to think that he's talking about their, the salvation of their eternal souls. That he chose Jacob before birth, apart from his um, actions, apart from his moral character, apart from any choices that he may have made, to be saved. And that he chose Esau, likewise, before birth, apart from any actions that he would take, or any choices that he would make, uh, to be condemned in hell. That's just not true. It's not talking about that at all. And we saw in here how that the the reference to Jacob I have loved, Esau I have hated, is actually a reference to Malachi chapter 1, verses 2 through 5. So that you see it's not about the, the baby Jacob in the womb of Rebekah, the baby Esau in the womb of Rebekah. It is about the nations they became centuries later, which is what Paul's talking about. He's not talking about the individuals or their eternal salvation. He's talking about the nations that came from it that ended up, you know, where we are in Romans. What shall we say then? And that's, you know, again, the 14th to the 17th verse. Is there injustice on God's part? By no means. He says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. We're not saying... You know, I mean, people read this and they think, well, God chose to condemn Esau to hell and he chose to save Jacob in heaven regardless of anything they did. As they say, they'll quote uh, uh, chapter 9, verse 10. Though they were not yet born and had done nothing either good or bad in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of him who calls. See, and they think that that means... Before you are born, whether you have done anything, good or bad, God's election has already been made. Not because of your works, but because of the one who calls. Meaning he's already decided you're going to be saved or you're going to be condemned. And it has nothing to do with your activity or your actions in life. That's Calvinist doctrine. That's what the Baptist Church believes. Uh, you'll have you'll probably be hard-pressed to find a Baptist who will affirm this but not a, a Baptist minister, because they know that's what they believe. That is what they teach. Okay, but that's error. And it's not what Paul's talking about at all. He's talking about the nations that came from them. Yes, it's true. God decided 
Israel would come from Jacob, Edom would come from Esau, that Jacob would be the child of promise. God made that decision. It was, from our perspective, arbitrary, and that's well within his purview. Is that unjust? No. He can choose to do that if he wants to. However he makes us in life, or whatever our circumstances in life might be, where, where we are born, to whom we are born, you know, with whatever we are born with or into. Those are all God's choices, and he's not unjust to make those choices. We can't blame him for things that are wrong uh, or things that are bad in our circumstances, uh, nor can we uh, congratulate ourselves for things that are good or that are, that are nice in our circumstances. We didn't choose them. We were born into this world. So it's God's choice. It's fine that he's allowed, he's allowed to make this choice. He decided Jacob would become Israel, that he'd be the younger one, but he would be the, the dominant nation. Those are God's choices. And so it is in the case of uh, Pharaoh. For this reason, 17th verse said, I've raised you that I might show my power in you, that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. God raised Pharaoh for the purpose of taking him back down. And this is true in life. God, he does what he will. In nations, in human lives, in, in societies, whatever it might be, he does what he will in this matter. Maybe the reason we have been brought to the greatness of power is so that we can be brought back down out of it. Your circumstances in life, whether it's wealth or poverty, freedom or slavery, you know, whatever, uh, you know, health or, or sickness is not guaranteed, is not reflective of your morality or of your value before the Lord God, and really has little or nothing to do with your spiritual affairs. You can be right with God and, and be penniless, or you can be penniless and covetous and be wrong with God. Uh, just the fact that you're poor or the fact that you are in need is not enough to make up for sin in life. It's not related, actually. There are different sets of uh, temptations that face people who are poor versus people who are wealthy. There are different circumstances. Uh, different circumstances make available different temptations for different people. Um, you know, Maybe you don't have access to some things that are very troubling for other people who have plentiful access to it, or whatever it might be. There's no telling. In whatever circumstances we are, it's well within God's purview to let you be born into those circumstances. And whether they're good or whether they're bad, whether you like them or you dislike them, <coughs> there's no injustice with God in the matter. And you don't have to be saved or lost on the basis of that physical condition. So when we say he raised Pharaoh for the purpose of displaying his power in him, well, that's fair. Pharaoh didn't, you know, didn't ask to be born either. He was born into this wealthy family. He was born powerful. They be became very, you know, the leader of the, this, the greatest nation on earth at the time. They had everything. And the reason for which that happened was because God knew that he was about to take that nation down and make a, a, an example of that nation. Well, what does that mean to Pharaoh's soul? Well, it, it actually doesn't mean anything to Pharaoh's soul. When he was doing well, that didn't mean he was saved or lost. And when he was... Uh, brought to his knees, if you will, uh, after Israel is already gone, he doesn't have to be saved or lost at that point either. Now, he did choose to continue in rebellion against the Lord, and he did chase them down into the Red Sea so as to murder them, and the sea swallowed him up. You'd be hard-pressed to say that man found his way to heaven down there at the bottom of the Red Sea. I don't think so. But... It didn't have to be that way. He didn't have to go into the Red Sea. He could have stayed back. We're not talking about him 
or anybody in their individual particular circumstances. We're talking about how God sets up lives and how God sets up nations and things are set out there on the table, but it's up to you what you're going to do in terms of the spirit. So when he says to him, yeah, for this reason I raised him up and I will have mercy on him, I will have mercy. That's not unjust. If he wants, for whatever his reasons are, we don't always know, in fact, we seldom them though. But whatever his reasons are for why certain individuals come to power or certain policies prevail or things happen to us in life with our own health or our own um, circumstances or our own family, whatever it might be, you may not know. Uh, usually, I think we don't know. And that's probably by design as well. Keep us from getting too, um, too big for our britches thinking too highly of ourselves. But uh, whatever those circumstances are, God is within his right to give us those circumstances, to give them or to take them, whether they're blessings or they're curses, you know, whatever it is, as Job said, uh, God has given, God has taken away. We accept good from God, shall we not accept adversity? Blessed be the name of the Lord. It's true. We can glorify him when we have plenty, uh, by being generous and being thankful. We can glorify him when we are poor, by being thankful and obeying him nonetheless. Um, the, you know, again, the physical circumstance has little to do with the spirit, and that's true here too. So, all that to say, don't read this as though it's saying our God is a monster, who decides ahead of time before you're born whether you're going to heaven or hell. That's not true. He waits to see what choices you're going to make. Now Romans 9, 18. He has mercy then on whomever he wills, and he hardens whomever he wills. You'll say to me then, why does he still find fault? For who can resist his will? But who are you, O man, to answer back to God? Will what is molded say to its molder, Why have you made me like this? Has the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another vessel for dishonorable use? What if God, desiring to show his wrath and to make known his power, has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction in order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy, which he's prepared beforehand for glory? Even us, whom he has called, from the Jews, not from the Jews only, but also from the Gentiles. So again, eighteen to twenty-four, we are not, you know, we are not changing the subject. The subject is still Jews and Gentiles together, from the same lump of clay, can be made into a vessel for honorable use or a vessel for dishonorable use, and the Lord. Has mercy on whom he wills, he hardens whom he will. What we mean by this is God chooses who is going to be saved, not who individually, but what kind of person is going to be saved. It's no different from what we were reading today in our Bible class where he said, you know, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven unless you are born of water and the spirit, unless you become like a little child in faith, right? unless you do the will of the Father. These are all things that are the choice that God has made about who will be saved. What does the saved person look like? That's the pattern of a person who is being saved. He's made that choice. Now it's up to us to choose to be that pattern or to conform to the pattern of the world. So, again, the misunderstanding here is to think that he is talking still about individuals. He was never talking about individuals in the first place, but they think that this is still about individuals, that somebody who has been created for the purpose of going to hell is a person whom he hardens because he wills to harden them. And then somebody says, well, why does he still find fault? 
for who can resist his will? As in, how could he send this person to hell when he created the person and gave them no choice? But who are you, O oh man, to answer back to God? See, the Calvinists will say, that's not your business. He can create people to send them to hell if he wants to. That's what they will say. And this is why they think that obedience and, uh, you know, works in addition to faith, because that's our series here, Faith and Works, they think that's arrogant. You are arrogant because you think you can obey God, or you think you can live right, or you think you can please Him, or you think you can know what He wants. Although the Bible tells you all of those things are so, and in fact, you must do so if you want to be saved according to the Scriptures. Not according to the Baptist, but according to the Scriptures. But they'll fight and say, no, that's not true. And, and they will come to verses like this. But no, God can choose to destroy them if he wants to. Well, I suppose in a vacuum where there's no such thing as justice, maybe he could do that. But that doesn't exist. And God is not that kind of unjust monster who makes a soul just to condemn it in hell. No, he doesn't do that. It's a place prepared for the devil and his angels. Not for us. If we go there, that was not by design. It's not supposed to be that way. So no, he's not talking about that. He's talking about the fact that Pharaoh's kingdom was going to be taken from him and he was going to be brought to his knees. He did not have a choice in that matter. He was going to become the most powerful leader in the world and he was going to be brought back down to his knees. He had no choice in that matter. And... He doesn't get to find fault with God about it either. Why did you take everything away from me? No, you don't get to answer the, mold, the, the, the potter back like that. He made you. He could do what he wants. That's what it means. Not that he had to be lost and he had no choice but to be lost. No. But more than this, consider... 2 Timothy 2 in connection with it because we read in Romans 9 again uh, why have you made me like this? The potter can make one lump out of the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for dishonorable use. One lump of clay can be used to make pots for different things. One of them can be the pot you know the thunder the thunder mug as they call it in Missouri I'm told <laughs> which is a bedpan uh, and another pot can be, you know, your stock pot. And, you know, uh, never confuse the two, I'm told. Uh, maybe that gives you potty mouth. I'm not sure, but I, I think you don't want to try it. Um, but the same lump of clay can be used to make more than one vessel. In 2 Timothy 2, 19 to 21, we read this. God's firm foundation stands bearing this seal. The Lord knows those who are his, and let everyone who names the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. Now in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also vessels of wood and clay, some for honorable use, some for dishonorable use. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, he will become a vessel for honorable use, set apart as holy, useful to the master of the house, ready for every good work. All right, so the potter, yes, has made um, pottery, some of it for honorable use, some of it for dishonorable use, but you are not the pottery. You become the shape, if you will. Like the, in this case, it's not that um, you have been molded, and that's what you are, and you can't change. The pattern has been molded, and that's what it is, and that can't change. Here's what an evil person does. Here's what a good person does. This is the pattern of somebody who will be saved. This is the pattern of somebody who will be lost. That is true, and you can't change that. But you can cleanse yourself, as it says in 2 Timothy 2, 19-21. If anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, he will become a vessel for honorable use. It's up to you which role you are going to play. God has made the roles and he has set them in stone 
they're not going to change. That is the pattern of a righteous person. That is the pattern of an evil person. That's not going to change. But you get to decide which of those you're going to be. Which one will you conform to, right? What do we say then? Verse 30 of Romans 9. That Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained it. That is a righteousness that is by faith. This is the conclusion here, is that the Gentiles who did not necessarily seek righteousness, they weren't necessarily looking for salvation as a nation the way that Israel was looking for salvation as a nation. Nonetheless, have attained it through Abraham, through faith, when we obey the gospel. We're suddenly grafted in to this that has been going on forever and ever that we didn't know about. We're the wild olives grafted into the cultivated olive. That's the idea that is coming up later in Romans, but 930 is where this is going. What shall we say? The nations who did not pursue righteousness have attained it. A righteousness that is by faith. Not like the righteousness of Israel by the law of Moses. But also, you think about when Paul was uh, being examined by Roman courts and he said, you know, it, I'm being judged or I'm being accused today for the hope to which my nation, the 12 tribes, uh, press that we seek night and day. You know, their nation was about the justice and the righteousness of God, the salvation of the world. That was always what Israel was about. The rest of the nations were not. They were just kind of floating, wandering out there, not seeking God. And nonetheless, people from those nations can be saved today. This is where Romans, that's what Romans 9 is really saying. So 931 of Romans, Israel, however, who pursued a law that would lead to righteousness, did not succeed in reaching that law. Why? Because they didn't pursue it by faith, but as if it were based on works. They stumbled over the stumbling stone, as it's written, Behold, I'm laying in Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. Again, you see how this is being conflated with obedience. We're not talking about obedience in an absolute sense. We're talking about the law of Moses. We don't mean you obeying God in baptism. We mean you eating kosher. Those are not the same thing. Eating kosher is not part of the law of the Lord Jesus. That's part of the law of Moses. And it was a sign, it was a symbol for what would come. Today, we are to make distinctions between what is clean and what is unclean. We are to choose the good and turn from the bad. That's the Christian's life. But the food is neither here nor there. That's just a physical, that doesn't matter. That's what you learn in the Lord. But see, the, the Calvinists, the Baptists, if you will, they read this as you tried to be saved by works when you were being baptized. Well, no. Uh, again, there's no work in being baptized. If that were true, you could find baptizing services in the phone book and all up and down this highway here. No, nobody's being served by that. No, It doesn't accomplish anything. It's not a work. It's just something that God tells you to do. Why would you think that you don't have to do what God tells you to do? Where in the Bible does it say something like that? Well, right here in Romans 9. No, friend. <laughs> How could that possibly be the case when Jesus said, Why do you call me Lord and do not do what I say? Or, not everyone who calls me Lord, Lord, enters the kingdom of heaven. 
only the one who does the will of the Father who is in heaven. Those are not compatible. Don't stick with your own reading of this. Let the Bible be truthful. Let yourself be wrong about it and work this out. Read the text so that it does agree with itself. And it does make sense and is consistent internally. And then you can conform to that pattern that is God's word. So no, uh, this is clearly more of the same. The nations who were not set up to look for righteousness nonetheless attain that righteousness through faith by Abraham. Whereas the Israelites of the first century were pursuing the law of Moses instead of seeing that it was meant to lead them to Christ. They didn't pursue it by faith, but as if it were based on works. They stumbled over the stumbling stone. As it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stone of stumbling, a rock of offense. That's the scriptures. 1 Peter 2 talks about it. In 1 Peter 2, 4. Uh, yeah, we need to do this. 1 Peter 2, 4 through 10. As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ, because it stands in Scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, Whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe. But for those who do not believe, he is the stone that the builders rejected and has become the cornerstone and a stone of stumbling, a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. Understand what we're saying here. Peter is saying exactly what Paul says. They're disobeying because it, they were destined to do it. But you are a chosen race. Well, now hold on. Aren't they the nation that seeks justice? Are they not the ones destined for salvation? It, and are they not the chosen race and we are all the other, we're the Gentiles? Not in the Spirit. Salvation is by the Spirit by faith, not in the law of Moses. And this is what he's telling them. He's the stone of stumbling, the rock of offense. Here now is faith, and they're not willing to accept the faith because the traditions are good. The physical, earthly traditions, the motions that we can go through, those are good. We don't want to have to do this faith thing. Believing in God, trusting in God, Putting two and two together, drawing conclusions. Oh, we can't do that. You once were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, now you have received mercy. Right? And this is back to Romans 9, 25. Uh, you know, as indeed he says in Hosea, Romans 9, 25, 26. Those who were not my people, I will call my people. And her who was not beloved, I will call beloved. Two different readings there. And, in another reading, in the very place where it was said to them, you are not my people, there they will be called sons of the living God. And in another place in Hosea, in that day, declares the Lord, you will call me my husband. It's Hosea 2, 16, 19 to 20. I will betroth you to me forever. I will betroth you to me in righteousness and in justice, in steadfast love and mercy. I will betroth you to me in faithfulness, and you will know the Lord. And, Hosea 2.23, I will have mercy on no mercy. The child named no mercy. I will say to the child named not my people, you are my people. And he will say, you are my God. Because he had told the prophet, he would have no mercy, and they are not my people, but he's talking about the fact that they will be reconciled, and he will establish, or he will embrace them again. That's Hosea 2, that Romans is talking about when he says, as indeed he tells them in Hosea, those who are not my people, I will call my people. What's that about? Jew and Gentile. The Gentiles are brought in. 
What's happening to the Jews? They're stumbling right now on the, the rock of offense. They want to hold on to the Jewish traditions, the, the law of Moses, the kosher eating, etc., etc., not realizing that those were all meant to bring you to Jesus and that they should embrace this, the faith. That's what Paul is talking about. And exactly why in Romans 10, finally, 1 to 3, Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them is that they may be saved. For I bear them witness they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge, being ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own. They did not submit to God's righteousness. That's what this is about. That's what it's always been about. He really wants Israel to be saved. They have a zeal, but it's not according to the knowledge of God. They are they don't understand the righteousness of God through faith in Christ Jesus, and because of that, they seek to establish a different one, their own. And in so doing, they're refusing to submit to the real righteousness of God. They're refusing to obey the gospel. And that certainly is what happened in the first century. Very many people refused to obey the gospel. Now, there were many people who did obey the gospel, like Paul. And, you know, we're very thankful for that. We wouldn't have a Bible if it weren't for them. But his prayer is for the nation. They had all these blessings for the purpose of bringing about the spiritual victory. And then when the spiritual thing came, they rejected it because it wasn't following their national cultural heritage. Well, it was never about your national cultural heritage. That was always a, something that came after the promise that leads up to the promise. Now that the promise is here, you don't need this other thing anymore. A scaffolding. So there you go. That's Romans 10, 1 to 3. So we'll have to pick up Romans 10 at the next opportunity. But again, understand the theme has not changed in Romans 9, even though people read this in the most disastrous ways, turning God into an arbitrary monster, deciding the fates of, of individual souls before they're even born. No, the Bible does not teach that. That's false. He certainly does set a pattern of who will be saved and who will be lost. But it's up to you whether you will follow one or the other. And uh, somebody said, uh, yeah, somebody said recently, people can worship God uh, and they can worship themselves and there's not another choice. That's true. I like that. Uh, people can worship God or they can worship themselves uh, and there aren't any other choices. Accurate. If you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, put him on in baptism for forgiveness of sins will help you to obey him in baptism. Become part of this chosen race, this royal priesthood, offering the sacrifices of right living today. If we can help you with our prayers, or if we can help you to obey the gospel, let your need be known by coming to the front while we stand and sing. <laughs>